them out. Uh, when you think about the Christian walk, when you think about following Jesus, you think about the Christian faith, um, what are some of the most important objects relative to our walk, relative to our faith? Or what are some of the most important functions, things that we do as Christians? Um, think of, like, for example, the Bible, certainly. I would say the Bible's one. Uh, fellowship, worship, those are the kinds of things. What are fundamentally some of the, what would you have in your top 10, top 12 dozen list of important objects or practices in the Christian faith? Go ahead, shout, shout them out. You don't need to raise your hand, just say it. Prayer. Prayer? Being your brother's keeper. Being your brother's keeper. Praise. Praise. Fellowship. Fellowship. How about any, those are activities, any objects? Can you think of any objects that are, that are significant to our faith, relative to our faith? The cross. Putting out seeds. The cross. Putting out seeds along the way. Seeds, sowing the word. Okay, we, we could probably do this for a while. We dig, and um, you probably would come up with stuff. But the one thing that I was looking for, and I was pretty certain I wasn't going to hear it, is an object that hundreds of years ago would have been one of the first things out of Christians' mouths. Certainly in the Old Testament, it was the premier one object that was the centerpiece of their walk with God and it carries over into the New Testament. And if you can't guess what that is, I'll just go ahead and tell you, it's the altar. The altar. <laughs> Praise God. How many former Catholics do we have here this morning? Well, shame on y'all. Y'all should have been, you know, the, the Catholic Church has been faithful through the centuries to keep the altar as a centerpiece of our worship. But really, in the Protestant movement, the altar has really pretty much disappeared. And it has kind of faded into abstraction. Most people have just abstract thoughts when they think about the altar. Because we've been taught that the altar is the table of our heart, that the altar begins in our heart. Because that's where we are sincere before God. And, and you can pray anywhere. You don't have to be in a church building. And is that true? That, are all those all not true? They are true. But because of that reality and because we cling so tightly to it, the concept of an actual physical altar as a place where we go to encounter God has kind of disappeared from the Christian church. Um, when architects in the past several years design and build new churches, they look like sound stages with a big you know, concert hall. The centerpiece of the church is the band, you know, is the, the music that's popular, the praise and worship. There's certainly nothing wrong with praise and worship. But it has definitely replaced the altar. I'd be willing to bet that if I were able to pull the permits and the papers, the architectural um, drawings of every church in the past 10 years, that broke ground and was built in America, that there would be a pretty small percentage of them that actually had an intentional altar or altar area because it's no longer the focus. And we have lost contact and connection with what the altar means. Yet, it was so important to Christians that it would have been in the top three, it, it, maybe the top ten, but uh, perhaps the top three list of believers in the book of Acts. That altar place, that place where they gathered, holy unto the Lord, that place where they came and knew that they had to take their shoes off because they were standing on holy ground. Now that holy ground didn't have to be in a church building such as this, it, whatever the place of meeting was, but where people's minds and hearts were prepared to respond to God calling them. That sense of removing your feet because we're, we are preparing to come and transact business with heaven. It is 
sad, and I'm going to deal with both the sadness and the joy of the promise of rediscovering the altar, but I believe in the hour that we live in, that darkness is rising in such ferocity in our time and claiming such, uh, uh, s- such dimension of our society that we need to discover When I read in the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, and see the power that is associated with the altar, I know we need to rediscover the altar and learn how to live the altar life and what it means because we need to get a hold of that power today. Can you say praise the Lord? So you get the idea of where we're going to go in the next couple of weeks. This morning, I want to talk about the heavenly altar. You may not know this, but there's an altar in heaven. And I'm going to read three verses to you, and we'll kind of collect our thoughts initially around those verses. The first is Matthew 23. In verse 19, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Which is greater? Which has more power? Which is more important? The gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Now, you might think a Catholic priest wrote that. You might think a Lutheran priest or Episcopal priest or some liturgical minister today said that. The Lord Jesus Christ said that. What is more powerful, the gift you place on the altar or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Let me go on to our next verse. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 10, the author says, we have an altar from which those who serve the, and worship in the tabernacle have no right to eat. We have an altar. And those that serve in the Old Testament tabernacle have no right to eat, to receive, to partake at the altar that we have. Finally, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And from the four horns of the golden altar which stands before God, I heard a solitary voice. Well, there is a place called the altar where business is transacted between heaven and earth. And I want you to notice from these three verses that I shared with you that, number one, the altar has the power to make the things that are sacrificed upon it to God, God's sacred possession. The altar has that power. That the lives or the things put upon it become God's possession and they become sacred. Jesus said that. Number two, God is the one who gives us the right to use the altar. The altar is not just out there, cranked up, plugged in, ready to go. And um, just like when you used to go years ago in the restaurant and they had the fortune teller, you'd put a dollar in, the thing would, you get your little fortune out of there. The altar doesn't work like that. You have to be given the right to enter the altar and to operate at the altar. Number three, the true altar stands before God in heaven. The true altar stands before God's throne in heaven. It's called the golden altar. So, how should we think about the altar? Well, the altar is kind of like God's phone system. Um, If there's going to be any talking or texting or sharing of files and pictures, it's going to be done through the altar. Any sharing, any communication, any giving of visions, any giving messages to God, any explaining things. Lord, I've diagrammed out my prayer. I, 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 want to, I want to offer up to you my intercession about this situation. There's a place where those texts to heaven and those phone calls from heaven get answered. It's, it's called the altar. And without the altar, there is no communication between heaven and earth. No exchange, no transaction, no exchange of power. And unlike the altars that are erected to the false gods, and we know of plenty of them throughout history and today, those altars that are erected to the false gods, 
This altar is not designed by human imagination or human need, but it's designed by the character of God. The character of God built the altar that's in heaven. And any altar upon the earth that is a true extension of the altar in heaven is designed not by your imagination or my imagination, not by our needs, but by God's character. So when we come and engage the altar of God, we must come into conformity to the character of God if we're going to be able to receive that call and make that call. Can you say amen? amen? Unlike the Tower of Babel, which was built from the earth up to try to reach God, the true altar begins in heaven and extends downwards into the earth. Now, any genuine altar that's upon the earth that God recognizes is actually an extension of the altar in heaven. So the golden altar in heaven ex exists eternally before the throne of God, but part of it extends down into the earth, and it extends down into all the different locations where there are true altars and where Christians are gathered and fellowshipping and calling upon the name of the Lord and receiving. And so because of that fact, true altars enable us to commune with the holy, almighty God, and they bring us into alignment with those essential qualities that make our Heavenly Father happy. That's why God communicates through an altar, because an altar demands our conformity. In fact, an altar helps to bring us into that conformity. So those qualities that the Father loves, we are conformed into those qualities as we enter his altar. Listen, um, the key to understanding, the name of this series, by the way, is The Altar Principle. The Altar Principle. And I call it The Altar Principle because rather than coming to you and telling you that there are special, sacred, and spiritual hot spots in the world, that you have to kind of pilgrimage there and go there. And on this mountaintop or in that valley or in, in that cathedral, there's an altar. And it's, it's an extension of heaven's altar. And if you go there, ooh, you're going to get in touch with God. So instead of preaching about altars in that sense of the word, I'm sharing about the altar principle. Because the altar that's a true extension of the golden altar before God can be almost any place but certain qualities define its construction and define its use. Someone say, praise the Lord. Now, I know you're probably thinking about this, saying, you know, your pastor's gotten a little strange lately, and he's kind of speaking in ethereal terms, the abstractness and everything. What is this? Don't worry, we're going to get to the part you like where the rubber meets the road. And next week, the rubber will really be meeting the road. You want to make sure you're not getting run over because there'll definitely be some rubber meat in the road in next week's message when I talk about the earthly altar. But this morning I want to talk about the heavenly altar piece. I want to make you aware that there are two pieces of furniture in heaven that are most prominently described, not only by the prophets like Daniel and, and um, Isaiah and Ezekiel in the Old Testament, but in the book of Revelation, those two pieces of furniture, you want to tell me what they are? They are the most spoken of, most referred to, most prominent pieces of architecture in heaven. Somebody know? Want to, throne. throne and altar. altar. You read the book of Revelation, there is almost more activity described coming out and around the altar of God than anywhere else. We often talk about, oh Lord, from your throne. But whatever happens through the throne, throne happens through the, from the throne happens through the altar. I was reading in Revelation, just brushing up on this, and it's just chapter after chapter, and an angel came out of the altar, and an angel went into the altar, and, and, and a word came out of the altar. It's, it is the phone booth the portal of God in his contact 
with the earth. So it's the iPhone. God's iPhone, amen, <laughs> hallelujah. So, hallelujah. So the key to understanding the altar principle, it's not found in religious formality, it's not found in complex theology, it's not found in rigid moralism or fanatical devotion. And there's nothing wrong with, with formalities, there's nothing wrong with theology, certainly morals are important, devotion's important. But all of those things that are, that are pressed and hard formed into some kind of uh, 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 rigorous practice, none of those things, none of them are the keys to understanding the altar. That's not what makes an altar, the altar of God. None of those qualities, not fanatical devotion, complex theology, rigid morality, none of those things are the qualities of our Heavenly Father and they're not the qualities of His altar. God's altar is governed by a simple balance of humility, honesty, and obedience. Humility, honesty with God, and obedience to God, to His Word. Those are the three simple qualities that define, qualify, and alter. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, again, speaking, said this, So then, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, Go first, be reconciled to your brother, then come and present your gift on the altar. So, if you look up both in the Old and in the New Testament, the word altar, there's a very simple, very short, very specific definition. The altar, the word altar means a place of sacrificial offering. It is the place of where we offer up to God a sacrifice. Jesus was obviously the greatest event that ever happened upon an altar. In fact, it could be said, the more you hear this message, that Jesus is the altar of the New Testament. Everything is received and offered up through Him. But before we go back to making this so abstract and ethereal that we think that whatever activities and thoughts and feelings uh, arise like steam off a, uh, after a rain off a summer highway, uh, as prayer rise up that we think that's communion with God, I want to bring us back to the idea that not all of that that we think is prayer is prayer. There's a thing called altar and we need to understand what it is. It is the place of sacrificial offering. Notice that Jesus said, when you come to pray, now think about it if that's you, and you've come to bring your gift to the Lord, and you, you want to come to the Lord and offer up a gift of praise or thanksgiving, or, or you want to commune with the Lord, the Lord says, wait. Before you offer that up, something's not right in your life. You know that your brother can't stand you and he told you on the phone the other day, just put this here, I'll be here when you come back, and go talk to your brother, get that straightened out, then come back. There's something about the altar that doesn't let us ignore that stuff. Why did God tell Moses, yes, I am burning this bush up, Yet it is not being consumed. Yes, I got a whole bunch of things to say to you, but before you do anything, do what? Take your shoes off because the ground you're about to step onto, holy ground. Holy ground. We love reading these stories, but we think none of those principles apply to us because we're New Testament people. We're Holy Ghost people. God's put the Holy Spirit in us, so we are the walking, talking altar. And uh, I, I'm here to tell you today that not everywhere you go and everything you do is an altar before God. And thank God for that. I thank God that not everything I say and everything I do, God considers an altar. I'd be in big trouble. Praise God.
Hallelujah. I thank God that, that I have to stop and think before I go to an altar. I, I thank God that I have to take account and I have to consider what I'm about to do as I approach God. I, I thank God for that because that fear of the Lord helps with a retention within me of respect for who I am approaching. And more importantly, the incredible reality of the power that I'm about to receive. God is transmitting power through his altars. And so we need to be ready to receive that power and be in position. So the word altar is a place of sacrificial offering. Let me expand this definition of an altar for you this morning. The whole purpose of the altar is to bring you and I into conformity with God's character. Remember I said earlier, the thing that built the altar, that builds altars, is not the imagination of men like, like um, Nimrod, but the character of God, the I am. God's character is immutable. It's unchangeable. It is what it is, was long before you and I got here. The altar is fixed in the character of God. And there's nothing that'll ever happen in this world that is going to change that. It is what it is. So the whole purpose of the altar is to bring us into conformity with the character that forged that altar. So that, and there's a practical reason for it, so that his influence and authority can flow through us out into the earth. When you come to the altar of God, God wants that golden altar that's before his throne to pour stuff out into you so that its influence, God's influence, can go out as you go. But first it's got to affect you before you can go out and it's going to affect somebody else. So the altar principle basically exists to prevent you and I from divorcing our praying from our responsibility to be Christ-like. People always want to know, I prayed I'm not getting anywhere. The altar forces us into our calling to follow Jesus and be Christ-like. We can't just run into the phone booth, drop a quarter, and call up. We know that that altar is the character of God. So as we approach the character of God, the force of God's character begins to convict us. Begins to, its light begins to reveal to us. As we approach, we're approaching the radiance of His holiness. And that's having an effect. So we can't even get into that altar to pray and to make a transaction without first making a sacrifice of ourselves. Receiving first the sacrifice that Jesus made that gives us a right to use the altar. God doesn't say, oh, you know what? You have some imperfections. We're not letting you in to the altar, into the communion. That's when you lift up Jesus, say, Father, I know I'm not right. Father, I know that there's, that there's weights and sins that so easily beset. I'm coming to you in need. The Father wants everyone who comes to him comes in need. Even the great prophet Isaiah, when he saw God, when he saw the power of God, he immediately realized, oh my God, I'm in big trouble. I'm not ready. God wants us to at that moment know why we're saved, why we have a Savior. Lord, I offer Jesus upon this altar for my sins and I ask you to forgive me through the blood of Christ, enter my daughter, enter my son, come, come before me. And then, once we've offered up Jesus, then we can offer ourselves, Lord, I give you my mind, I give you my time, I give you my schedule. Holy Spirit will work with you, help you, guide you. You see what's happening? You see, the altar is more than just those kind of, um, you know, off-the-cuff prayers that are shot up like bottle rockets without any preparation, without any thought. Does God hear those? I don't know. We'll have to ask him when we get there. But I am convinced that a lot of things that we pray and throw up, God, 
He probably hears them all, but is he going to respond to them? So I need God to respond. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? So the altar principle exists to keep us from separating our responsibility to be Christ-like from our need to pray. they got to go together. Amen? So for that reason, true altars simultaneously exist in two locations. I want you to see this. They exist before the presence of God. Amen. And the altar also exists in that corner of your living room where you've got a chair or out on the patio or the cl prayer closet of your bedroom, the place that is sacred that you've set apart. That's a place where before you step into it, already you're beginning to prepare. Already you're ready to offload some of the burdens and some of the things you know aren't right. You run into your little prayer cubicle or wherever it is. First thing that hits you is conviction. I know I'm not right. You see? What's happening? The fear of the Lord is working. We're realizing I'm coming before Almighty God. Hallelujah. And so the altar exists in two locations simultaneously at the same time, at the throne of God and here in the front of the sanctuary, in your place, wherever your altar is. So there's the heavenly altar that Jesus presides over as the high priest. And then there is the altar, your altar, where he presides as your savior and the Holy Spirit as your comfort and convictor and teacher. There should, there should be altars in your life. And let me just stop and ask the question, do you have an altar in your life? Are there altars in your life? I want you to let that question just marinate in your mind for the rest of this message and, and on into the next week. Because there should be altars in your life where Jesus' authority from the golden altar before the throne of God can influence and affect you and then heaven can pour into you and heaven can pour through you. So the altar principle exists to make you a vessel rather than a hose. See, that's, I've heard people when they teach on the move of the Holy Spirit use uh, the example of a hose. And I always cringe a little bit because it, 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 a hose is just a dead impersonal object. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical engineering facilitating tool. It just gets fluid from one place to another. And you're not a hose. You're not a hose. You're a vessel. And so the altar is designed to turn you into a vessel, not use you as a hose. Is that making sense to anybody this morning? It's, it's designed to make you an ambassador rather than a puppet. Jesus doesn't need puppets out there that, you know, fingers are moving the puppets and a voice is talking through the puppets. God doesn't need people out there going, Jesus is Lord and let me tell you what the Bible says. And Is there anything wrong with telling people about Jesus? No. Is there anything wrong with talking about what the Bible says? No. I, God, we need to do it. But it needs to be done not by puppets, but by ambassadors. Ambassadors. An ambassador understands what an altar is because the altar sent the ambassador. The ambassador picks up the phone in the, in the altar. Can you say amen? amen? Jesus teaching on prayer was the altar user guide. The altar comes with a user guide. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Start with me. Your will be done. Start with me. Start with my home. And fan out from there. Give me today my daily bread the food that I need, the finances. And more than anything else, give me the assignment. How do you want me to serve you today? Give me the bread of life, my daily bread. And Lord, forgive me my sins. As I take the time to think through my mind that I don't hold a grudge towards anybody, 
Father, I want to be clean. I want to be unburdened. Release me from unforgiveness so that I can be forgiven. And Lord, yours, not mine, yours is the kingdom of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Yours is the kingdom now and forevermore. I praise you. I leave this time of prayer. I temporarily leave this altar by reminding myself, King Jesus, reign forever. Rule, King Jesus. You are Lord. I came here to pray, not to press my will into your hands as much as I came to find out what do you want. What is your will? What do you want, Lord? Help me to be a person who's available to find out what you want. You know, in the day that we live in, we don't have any more room for anything else. Kind of as Scott was mentioning, our lives are filled. Most of us are not sitting around with nothing to think about, much less nothing to do. We are very busy. There's no room for anything else. Because if there is room, we quickly fill it up with something. A hobby. Uh, uh, you know, another work, another project, whatever it is. We got lists that are backed up, which means there isn't any room for God either. And so when I come to that altar, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's like the force of heaven pressing down upon me and displacing all that's important to me. Oh God, when I came into this prayer, it was so important. I, I, I needed you to deal with this. But now, Lord, I've kind of shifted gears and, and there's been a change. And now I'm genuinely interested. What are you doing? What are you doing in my community? How can I help? What do you want me to do? How can I be your woman? How can I be your man? How can I be your servant? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. You see, the altar affects you. The altar changes you. Do you understand how this is so vastly different from the Christian who just pops off a prayer whenever it enters their mind? Oh, well, I'm just going to pray. Now, I'm not saying that when you jump on your motorcycle or, you know, climb into your car and go tearing off and you, you pray a prayer that God doesn't hear it. Because that could be an altar. It could be an altar moment. Only God knows. But I will say this. And I'm going to talk about this specifically next week. There are places where altars exist. They may not always be an altar, but there are places that people go to. They meet with God. And that is so vital. And we'll talk more about that next week. So Jesus, Jesus teaching on prayer is the altar user's guide. I'd like you to, with the next scripture that I read you, I'd like you to envision the possibilities that could happen in your altar, your extension of the golden altar of God. Take it from the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verse 3 through 5. Some of you are going to be very amazed at what you're about to hear. This is in the book of Revelation. And another angel came and stood at the altar, with a golden censer, a golden censer. Uh, it's, it's a golden rod that has a pot at the end of it that has fiery coals of incense in it, burning incense, and the incense smoke is coming out of it. And that, those coals and that fire represent the holiness of God accepting the incense of our prayers and of our worship. And the smoke of that rising up is a symbol of God accepting our prayers. So now that you know what the symbol is, I'm is behind the, the golden censer. Let me show you it again. An angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. And he was given much incense to offer it with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Wow. Do you, you catch that? Certainly you're not dull. You catch that? You, you're getting what's going on? 
Do you realize millions of people are praying from the earth? They're sending their prayers up. Most of those prayers, people pray thinking, I'm not getting through. I sound ridiculous when I pray. I can't put three words together. You know, the, the pastor, the priest, they sound awesome when I pray. I sound like a hillbilly. Um, we, we pray, but how many of you know God's not listening for the religious content in your prayer? He's listening for the truth, the sincerity, and the willingness to be obedient. And so those prayers as they leave your altar sound crude, sound rough, don't sound appealing, don't sound like the thought was fully developed it sounds like the thought was only partially expressed. But those limping, sometimes wounded prayers, they ascend up. And as they reach the altar in heaven, the angel mixes burning incense of God's holiness with those prayers before they go before the Lord. Now, I'm sure this happens in a split second of time. It leaves your mouth and it happens that quick, that quick. But know that the altar in heaven is adding a treatment to your prayers. The altar in heaven is adding a treatment to your prayers. It's making them awesome in the ears of God. It's making your prayer, praise powerful. It's making your petitions, your declarations significant. At your bedroom altar, you're saying, Lord, I just thank you for your authority. Satan, I command you to get out of my house. And the devil's on your shoulder speaking to you right back in your ear. Are you kidding? That's a rebuke? I'm not going to pay attention to that. That was silly. Your kids won't even listen to that. It didn't sound like much. But it got treated at the golden altar. And the angel of God said, you better get out of that house. The angel of God slaps those demons down and said, you heard my servant? Get out of this house. Leave. Lord, and there you are with your feeble prayer, lifting it up. Do you understand that the altar is a machine? If, I can, if there's such a thing as a spiritual machine, the altar's it. And it transforms your prayer and brings it before God and God's answer. Well, I'll read it to you because it's what comes next. It says, The incense with all the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings and flashings of lightning and an earthquake. You think that God is not hearing you. You think your prayers are anemic because of the way they sound. Or the reality that you're weak when you pray them. But let me tell you, it is not your skill in praying. It is the power of the altar. When you are truly humble before God, when you are truly acknowledging Him, and you are willing in the hands of God, your prayers put the mighty golden key of Jesus' authority into the lock and unlock the doors that no man can shut and shut the doors that no man can open. Hallelujah. Amen. Lightning and thunder and, 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 uh, and an earthquake. Wow. What does that mean? That means God's moving the earth with the prayers from the altar of God's people. Let me share with you one more scripture. We're going to close with this. I alluded to it before when I talked about Isaiah. But I want to make this point. When you go into the altar, when you go into the altar to pray, you're coming to Jesus' altar. You're coming to Jesus' altar. When you do that, He cleanses you of your sin. Now, I don't know if you understand what that means, but you know, when we sin and we know we've, we've blown it, we have a weight. It's, it's literally like a big wooden yoke that sits upon us. It's, it's called a yoke of guilt, of condemnation. 
And if you've got one of those sitting on you, if you've experienced it, it, it makes movement very difficult. It's, you can't do anything without thinking about it. You're not fluid, you're not mobile. You're weak under that yoke. When Jesus forgives your sin, you know, we can mentally read those verses in the Bible and say, oh, well, you know, I, I know that Jesus forgives me. But has he forgiven you? Have you presented yourself at the altar of God so that he can forgive you? Take the yoke off, break the yoke, destroy the yoke. This is where the Protestant church has missed what the Catholics held on to. The Catholics preserved the truth that there's something sacred about the altar of God, that things happen at the altar of God. And the Protestants, in their theologically oriented form of Christianity, do everything from a mental state. And that, by the way, explains the weakness of our witness, of our testimony, of our walk with God, because we don't realize the power of actually getting up and going to an altar and falling on our face before God and saying, Lord Jesus, I need to be forgiven. And then you feel that yoke being broken, those locks being broken off that yoke. Then you can feel the angels of God. Yes, the angels of God pulling that yoke apart and lifting it off of you. And at that moment, you're not just having to mentally believe that you're free. You are being set free. Set free. Do you understand that? Do you understand the difference between those two experiences? Because if you do, then you're beginning to understand why the altar is so important. Why Satan worked for hundreds of years to expunge the concept, the principle of the altar, out of our Christian experience. Why the devil is behind. Now, I'm going to tick some people off because I know there are going to be people out on the, uh, out on the internet going to watch this message and, and it, they're going to be peeved. But I'm going to say it anyway. It's never stopped me before. Um, but that's why the devil... is behind a lot of the designs of the way our churches are built today. It doesn't mean that people had evil intent or didn't want. It's just that it's sins of omission. It's sins committed by ignorance. It's sins committed by overemphasizing worship at the expense of the altar of prayer, of conformity, and of obedience, and of character. People can run in and jump up and down and scream and carry on and weep and everything and think, oh man, we had a great time. And, oh, I'm not going to take anything away from that. That's so wonderful, so important. But week after week, month after month, and the life never changes. The life, what is that? What is, it's not discipleship. It's not Christianity. It's something. I submit that it is a very fundamental base level of Christianity. And the author of Hebrews says, we ought to be going on to perfection. We ought to be growing. We ought to be challenged. We ought to not just simply be a Christian that goes to a church and has a bumper sticker and owns a Bible. We need the experience of the altar returned, and we need it to happen as fast as possible. We need the altar returned to the church. We, and you're, you're really going to not like my message next week. If this is bothering you, you're really going to not like what I say next week because I'm going to make a serious case for the physical existence of an altar area and how we treat it. Because God has some business he wants to conduct between heaven and earth. And there's precious few altars where he can pour his power out. Are you listening to me? Amen. God is looking for a place that will receive what he is wanting to do. I remember, and I, I know if I were you sitting there, this would be nauseating to me. I can't stand it when old timers get up and say, back in our day. 
But I am going to say this. I remember years, decades ago, you couldn't go into a Pentecostal church where there wasn't an altar that had one or a bunch of people in it weeping, praying, three or four people around them, laying hands on them, giving them the Pentecostal massage. We made fun of that for years, but God help us. Because they had something. We lost it. We don't have it. The only place that exists is in our postcards. The only place that exists is in our phones, our pictures, in the memories of our mind. And I, for one, am hungry. I want it back. I want it back. I want to be a part of a church that actually has an altar where people are actually weeping before God, coming before the Lord, kneeling at the altar and calling out upon Him where heaven is transacting business with earth. You want to know what the key to revival, change, or any of those things are? That's what it is. So let me finish with this verse out of Isaiah. Isaiah is in the sanctuary, he's praying, and uh, God comes in. We only have a, a, a very kind of sketchy description from him of what it looked like, but God comes in, and Isaiah is flabbergasted. He is flabbergasted. The presence of God comes in. The smoke of the Lord's presence comes in while he's praying. And I want you to listen. I'm going to jump in in the middle of, of his narrative as he describes the event. Then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed for I am a sinful man. Now let me pause and say that he probably didn't go into that sanctuary to pray with foremost on his mind the thought, I'm a sinful man. We walk around most of the time with some kind of load of of easily besetting sins upon us that we've just learned to live with. But the closer you get to the presence of God, the more you can feel the chokehold of Satan around your neck. You know you're a sinful person. He said, it's over, I'm doomed. When God walked in, the first thing he realized, I'm a sinful man. I have filthy lips. This is Isaiah, the prophet of God. I have filthy lips, he says, and I live among a people of filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. But then one of the angels flew at me with a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And he touched my lips with it. And he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord say, Who shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Lord, send me. Wow. You want to know how to get called? You want to know what it takes for God to use you? There it is. There it is. Isaiah the prophet. I have filthy, unclean lips. I'm an imbecile. And now I'm in big trouble because God has walked in. And I am totally unprepared. I am undone. But look at the altar. Look at the mercy. Look at the power. Look at the purpose. An angel of God was there the whole time. Took a burning coal off that altar. And said, here, and seared his lips. And he says, now your sin's gone. And the minute his sin was gone, he jumped up, said, Lord, here I am, send me. Here I am. There's no re I can think of no reason why I cannot go. Here I am. I'm available. And God sent him. You can see why we need an altar today. Can you see why, let me say it again, do you see why we need an altar today in our lives? You need an altar in your life. God is ready to do for you what he did for Isaiah. 
He is no respecter of persons. And let me tell you, the hour that we live in, the world we live in, oh my God, the harvest is on fire and we need laborers.